All right, he... Oh, is that evasion? That is unfortunate for me. Uh, that's 100 accuracy, though. Uh, uh, if I do the uh, little dash and gleam, I get to go twice. Whew. All right. And I'll take the two, but that might kill. All right. <sighs> uh, I know we've never... I've never used you or anything like that, but you can, like, finish this fight up, can't you? Wow, what an anticlimactic ending to Giratina. <laughs> Guess Meringue was not the one to do it. Yes! Samus! Leonis the web on us in final! Vamos! No! Say! Look at that, like, on the guy! It's really that easy, folks. That's what you think? What the? That, what? Oh, no! What oh. eh. Okay, so a Pokemon fight with three waves, that's normal. Pero qué me estás contando, tío? No me jodas. You're kidding me, bro. What? <laughs> Fire. <laughs> Where the fuck they do that at? <laughs> what the fuck? What? Bro, he did not. They did not just do that. Holy crap! That was so cool. What? This shit had people acting like it was 2015 and the Sans fight just dropped. <laughs> okay. This script was written before the release of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. There isn't anything that becomes contradictory because of that, I think, but I figured I should mention it. I'm kind of slow. Uh, hence why I haven't posted a YouTube video in about four months. The last one did really good though, thank you. I appreciated all the comments. I had a lot of fun making it. The final battle of Pokemon Legends Arceus is something fans have wanted desperately for decades. For the last few generations of Pokemon, Game Freak has served players different games of disparaging levels of ease. The series is one whose target audience is children, after all, the type who initially picked up red and blue in the 90s or black and white in 2010. What Game Freak didn't realize, or was at least hesitant to act upon, was the fact that their actual audience is 100% masochistic gamers who love a good challenge. The final fight against Volo on Mount Coronet in Pokemon Legends Arceus was, at the time, a hot topic among fans for that very reason. The battle is difficult and requires actual brain power to overcome. Because of the new gameplay Legends introduced, the nature of trainer battles is now a back and forth one hit KO fest. Do I say Oko? <laughs> No, in which you must take advantage of differing levels of speed to stay at least one Pokemon ahead of your opponent. 
This new formula is easily disrupted by adding additional Pokémon to the opposing team. If both parties are full, with six Pokémon each, and the player defeats the opponent with only one Pokémon remaining, introducing a seventh Pokémon on the opposing side is almost guaranteed to deliver the finishing blow, especially if it's fast, which Giratina unfortunately is. Or fortunately, I guess it, it depends on how you see it. Now, the player's goal isn't just to get to the end of the fight one step ahead of the opponent. It is instead to predict his next move and the move after that and so on in order to stay two or three steps ahead in preparation for the team of eight they have to face. That is, provided they didn't just go ham on the grinding to win. Unfortunately, that's the nature of JRPGs. I spent about two hours chipping away at this boss, coming up with new strategies, changing move selections, predicting what he would send out in response to every different choice I could possibly make, only to realize that when the fight was over, it wasn't actually over. I'm the type of person that never uses a potion or revive in Pokemon because it feels like cheating an already easy system, but when I finally finished off Giratina only for it to revive before my very eyes, I realized that this fight would require every underhanded tactic I had up my sleeve. If he was gonna cheat, then I would too. Pride or no pride, it forced me out of old habits that stemmed from other recent Pokemon games, the kinds of habits where I set restrictions on myself to make the game harder. The same can be said of fights against other characters like Kamado, Benny, and Ingo in the rather pathetic post-game battle facility. I didn't particularly struggle with the three of them, but I could feel the difficulty ramping up slightly when I won with only one or two Pokémon left. Of course, it's easier to stay ahead in the fight against Volo when you know what's coming. Many players did. Based on musical and visual cues, as well as a glimpse at his team earlier in the game, players who have finished Pokémon Diamond, Pearl, Platinum, or even Black and White will know exactly what to expect. Volo's team is a near carbon copy of the iconic champion of the earlier Gen 4, Cynthia. Her fight is notoriously difficult. It's something of a meme in the fanbase. It's... Uh... Unfunny, to be honest. <laughs> It's something of a meme in the fanbase, and hearing the first chords of her piano-based encounter theme, which is now used in homage as the final battle theme in Legends, still gives players a feeling of dread years down the line. The theme. It's the theme. It's only fitting that Cynthia's fight be done justice for its iconic difficulty in this equally challenging final battle. Equally challenging in that it's f***ing easy. Sorry. <laughs> I'm lying to you. Just like the Sinnoh region's champion battle, Legend's final fight takes place during the apex of your journey, the part where everything you've fought so hard to achieve comes to a head against the last thing standing in your way. This time, however, more is at stake than the player's shiny new champion title. Throughout the story, Volo is an invaluable ally to the player character, assisting them using his knowledge of Hisuian myths and legends. Upon his betrayal, he explains that he summoned the legendary Pokémon Giratina, a Pokémon who seeks revenge on Arceus after being banished for its violence to a world on the reverse side of our own. This goes all the way back to the Bible. Together, Volo and Giratina created the ever-present rift in space-time that the player character is transported through from the future during the opening sequence of the game. Through the rift, the player appears in ancient Hisui, the region that will come to be known as Sinnoh in the future. The player spends the entire duration of the game fighting to close this rift and clean up its side effects, sacrificing their only way of getting back to their era in the process. Volo, who was at the player's side throughout much of their journey, was the cause of their suffering and the suffering of their friends as a result of the rift the entire time. The lingering question is why? Why would the player character's seemingly most loyal friend betray them? The answer the game offers is that Volo wants to subjugate Arceus alongside Giratina in order to use Arceus's power to destroy the current world and create a new one absent of suffering. The world in which Pokemon Legends Arceus takes place definitely seems difficult to live in. Humans still live relatively primitive lives, and that leads to many subsequent struggles. Also, because it is set in such a distant past, technology as a means of self-defense barely exists, and as a result, the existence of Pokemon, who have yet to assimilate into human society, are terrifying and dangerous to humans. The player hears of many instances of injury and even death at the hands of wild Pokemon. Pokémon, from the perspective of these people, are essentially a thousand different breeds of deadly wild beasts. This is a menace. 
However, after closing the space-time rift that caused certain powerful yet pacifistic Pokémon known as Nobles to go rogue, and collecting ancient artifacts belonging to Arceus called Plates, the player holds the means to summon Arceus, creator of this seemingly unfair circumstance. In doing so, it is revealed that the player's arrival in Hisui through the space-time rift was a choice Arceus made in order to secure someone strong enough to protect itself and the current world from Giratina and Volo. As the player climbs Mount Coronet, a location familiar to all those who played the Pokémon game set in modern Sinnoh, they may remember what lies at its peak. At the top of the mountain is a broken temple, which is known in modern Sinnoh as Spear Pillar. Ironically, in the original Sinnoh games, the player fights alongside Cynthia here to stop the game's central antagonist Cyrus from making contact with Giratina. When you meet Volo at Spear Pillar, he is the first to call it by that name. He describes the ruins as pillars now turned into spears, stabbing into the heavens. It is an apt description of the battlefield, perfectly encompassing his motivation to defeat you and subsequently Arceus in these ruins. These gods have pitted the two of you against each other for their own ends. Giratina seeks revenge on Arceus for banishing it, and Volo wants to defeat the player to have an audience with Arceus, forcing it to create a world without the suffering it indifferently watches from above. Volo is literally the player's god-given rival. And that is definitely a first for Pokemon. Would you consider him a mean rival? Is it mean to kill people? But he's nice though, so how can he be mean? All the aspects of this conflict culminate into a rare moment for Pokemon, one in which everything seems to come together. The fight is difficult, has high stakes, and is expertly designed, from its many phases, to the way they are revealed, to every small ironic detail and reference, to the very stadium it takes place in. For the first time, there is a Pokemon battle whose difficulty matches its narrative meaning and importance. Yet, for some reason, the battle doesn't feel all that impactful. Here's the important part. How did the player feel experiencing this narrative meaning for the first time? What was going through your head regarding the emotional weight of this conflict? Beyond the initial surprise of Volo's sudden and late betrayal, or the difficulty spike of the battle, not too much, right? This isn't a test of intelligence or anything. You're not any less attentive for feeling emotionally disconnected from the finale, so be genuine. The player eventually defeats Volo, he sees himself out, and it's back to business completing the Pokedex. From my perspective experiencing Legends Finale for the first time, I was happy with where the story went. I do believe with everything in me that this is one of, if not the height of standalone scenes in Pokemon. The sheer epicness of the conflict and all the little details that are a part of it is a breath of fresh air never seen before in the series. So why, amidst everything, did I feel like something was so clearly missing? Based on all the references and little meanings I noticed during this battle and the moments prior, Volo should be one of the greatest greater antagonists in Pokemon. And he is, or he might be. The same can be said of Pokemon Legends Arceus as a whole. Legends is a Pokemon game with a decent story. The concepts are strong, the references to established lore are fun and rewarding for fans who pay attention, and its core theme is one I resonated with. It makes total logical sense, and there were multiple occasions where I was quite invested, the post-game finale being one of them. Still, something about it feels... No, it lacks feeling. All the pieces of a great story are there, so why does it not feel as satisfying as I'd hoped? Whatever the qualm I have with this standout moment will almost certainly lead me to what is holding back Legends as a whole from reaching its full potential. Discovering what that qualm is and applying it to the rest of the story is what I've set out to achieve. This is a new series I've taken to calling The Writer's Almanac. It's a conglomerate of my thoughts on stories I've experienced for the sake of organizing and expanding my own knowledge and abilities as a writer. With it, I can hopefully inspire a few others to take an in-depth look at these stories with me. To support the channel and the creation of more content like this, please consider leaving a like and subscribing. It genuinely means a lot to know people are interested in my thoughts. Also, if anything in this analysis resonates with you, I'd highly recommend staying updated on our own original story, the comic series I lead up. We're currently working on the pilot chapter, which will be uploaded onto our website as soon as it's ready. It's hype as hell. You can stay posted through our social media if you're interested.
Pokemon has never been astoundingly good at storytelling through video games. That isn't to say they've never tried or never succeeded, but of all the game companies, Game Freak is the king of creating unique concepts and failing to deliver on them. After Sword and Shield shattered my heart into a million little disappointed pieces, I kept my expectations for Legends low. Pokemon stories have a bad habit of creating very basic, predictable scenarios due to their antagonists' extreme goals. The series has created quite the cliche for itself, with the advent of create a better world antagonists. But for the first time, Legends almost made it work. Needless to say, I was very pleasantly surprised by their decisions in this aspect. Aside from Volo, there isn't really an antagonist to speak of, which I think was a good decision. Instead of the formulaic evil team, usually some corporation or gang with a few admins and a leader, which every Pokemon game in the past has had, Legends Arceus chooses to vilify a force of nature. This decision keeps things simple without creating the need to conceptualize what would be the ninth evil team of the franchise. Not counting spin-offs, which ironically always have the best ones. Instead, the player travels to snuff out the space-time rift and its afflicted Pokemon. They only needed to make one character with the means and a reason to cause such a catastrophe. The main offenders of the Create a Better World archetype are Lysander from Pokemon X and Y and Cyrus from the original Sinnoh games. This category could also include Archie and Maxi because they seek to shape a universe to their own ideal world through a little villainy. Uh, Rose could also be here, I guess, but we'll get to him later. There are two categories that I believe go into achieving this type of villain well, the motivation and the means. Both of the antagonists listed above lack a very compelling motivation. The worlds they live in are perfectly fine and have no cause to be undone. Their motivations are mostly chalked up to just being crazy, which certainly seems accurate. In the end, it boils down to a conflict between good and evil. It isn't anything brain tickling, but at least they aren't Chairman Rose. You can play through X and Y and Diamond and Pearl's main plots without being punched in the gut during the finale. But I guess that means Sword and Shield had a more engaging setup for the ending to be so soul-crushingly disappointing. <laughs> I sound so f***ing mad about it. I am mad about it. Unlike Lysander and the rest, Cyrus has the unique circumstance of the means to create a better world. Sinnoh's legendary Pokemon are at the top of the chain. These legendaries were the creator of the world and therefore can be used to reverse that creation. This is what elevates Cyrus ever so slightly above his competition, barring the fact that hundreds of people willing to follow a guy who will literally just kill them is a bit unrealistic. Also, I think he dies at the end. No other Pokemon villain has done this, so that's pretty original. The means Cyrus obtains to enact his will are cool and terrifying. They're truly deadly if put in the wrong hands. Hence why Legends Arceus decided to once again make those means, those legendary forces of nature, the point of contention for its story. That means Volo has both of those two categories. Because he is in a Sinnoh-based game, he certainly is close to attaining the means to create a better world. Plus, he's just one guy with a lot of ambition. He's so much stronger than everyone else in this time period due to his unique ability to connect with a full party of six Pokemon that he doesn't need to assemble some sort of redundant team. As previously established, it's also much easier to empathize with him due to the cruel and unrelenting setting of Legends. For some reason though, the game refuses to take advantage of that fact. The most important scenes for villains like this, especially when they're twist villains, are the big reveals and their explanations, overt or otherwise. Lucky for us, those scenes are one and the same here. But for the brief moment Volo is given to openly discuss his actions and motivations, with the player, he instead crazily explains what the consequence of his actions would be, effectively framing himself as the bad guy instead of embracing the consequences for what he should believe is the greater good. Of course, you have to be a little sussy to pursue destroying the world so passionately, but he's given the same treatment as the rest of the crazy fix the world villains when every bit of motivation he could give is right there in front of the player. It's all just off screen, as if Game Freak was scared of making a complex villain. The player is instead left to assume what his motivations probably are themselves. Most of what I explained earlier about the emotional stakes of the fight technically isn't really said. So if you found yourself not feeling the weight, it isn't because you missed something, it's because it wasn't actually there. This wouldn't be a problem if Volo's ideals were implied more explicitly earlier, but the amount of scenes that he's a part of and plays an important role in is pretty minimal. Although he's present often, he doesn't have much important dialogue that hints toward his beliefs. The pieces are all there, but Game Freak always seems to stop just before they finish their own puzzle. The obvious parts aren't put into place. 
case. To figure out how Game Freak has addressed motivation in the past, let's look at two extremes of Pokemon villains, the worst and the best. One I find to be a core example of the puzzle issue, and the other, the shining outlier. Pokemon Legends falls somewhere between the two of them, not outright offensive, but also not entirely fulfilling. I have a genuine affinity for Sword and Shield. It has some fascinating concepts for a Pokemon game, what with the tournament setting, the trainer cards, the reverence of Pokemon battles as a sport. It feels like the natural next step for the world of Pokemon, and I have to wonder why other games in the series didn't take that step first. The characters absolutely thrive in this setting. Leon and Hop are deeply involved in and affected by the sport of Pokemon battling, while Bait and Marnie are more related to the closed doors aspects of being quote unquote celebrity. Sword and Shield is the first Pokemon game to truly integrate battles and the gym challenge into its world, and connect them with some of the most fun world building I've seen in any game at all. While there are other aspects of the game I enjoyed, I sadly have to draw the line of complimenting its writing there. For everything the game builds up and the conflicts it lights within its characters, it delivers on almost none of them. For example, the hometown hero Marnie has a major role near the closing act of the story, and it hardly feels deserved due to her sheer irrelevance to the rest of the plot. The player character's childhood friend and neighbor Hop goes on an emotional journey discovering that his love for Pokemon doesn't need to keep him in his brother's shadow, but the interactions he has with the player, while frequent, are so repetitive that it made a lot of people dislike him. Pierce, Marnie's brother and the passionate leader of her fan club, also has a lot more to do with the plot than he might initially let on. Why is his gym and his hometown the only place in Galar without a proper stadium and power spot? Did Chairman Rose and his company choose not to give him one? Why doesn't Pierce want a power spot? Did he have some sort of falling out with the chairman? Could it be they're setting up Rose's villainy by making Pierce, the leader of the fake out evil team, in on the true villain's evil deeds? No, actually. He is just not allowed to have it. For some reason. Perhaps most disappointingly, the player's mean rival, Bade, gets a happy ending off screen, completely separate from and devoid of any natural closure with the villain who caused his problems. Which leads me to Rose. Where to begin? <laughs> Chairman Rose is obviously the villain of Pokemon Sword and Shield. The instant he comes on screen, even the game's target audience can recognize he's up to no good. Still, it's one thing to set up what a villain is secretly thinking behind the scenes, hinting toward their true goal in the process. It's another to simply introduce a character who is vaguely shady and sort of mean to people familiar with storytelling tropes, and then expect the audience not to feel jarred out of their seats when the business guy starts hatching God from an egg and blasting tone-deaf Dark Souls boss music. Music. I'm convinced this wasn't actually supposed to be how the story ended and they just ran out of time or something because the tone was so all over the place and no one in their right mind would leave all those loose ends untied. Especially when the more fitting direction is so obvious to everyone playing through the game. So, for a brief second so I can stop talking about this guy, what was the point of Sword and Shield? Well, Leon very kindly explains the theme of the game for us at the end and if you're paying attention, you might pick up on it earlier as well. Sword and Shield is a story about passing the torch, so to speak, from one generation to the next, and creating a world where the new generation can continue to thrive. It's a good message, especially for a game with such a modern setting and tone. We see this theme present in many characters in Sword and Shield. Hop and Leon, Marnie and Pierce in the Spike Myth Gym, Opal and Bade in the title of Fairy Gym Leader, Sonya and Magnolia, the Professors, and so on. A good story will also intertwine a little bit of its core message into the antagonist's motivation so that when a confrontation with the antagonist happens, it's given some type of relevant purpose. I've gone a long time without uh, fucking up. What's going on? Based on Sword and Shield's message and Leon's final speech, you'd expect Rose to be the greedy sort of antagonist who only sees the present and never the future. One who doesn't care who or what he hurts later so long as he gets what he wants now. Rose isn't that sort of villain. Instead, he's supposed to be a morally gray antagonist who is attempting to disrupt the status quo the now for the sake of the future, so the opposite of what the story was building toward. Rose isn't exactly a good guy. We know that he took advantage of a burned out midlife crisis office worker and an emotionally vulnerable orphan as a means to his own ends, then brushed them both aside when they slipped up somewhere along the line. 
In fact, the conflict in Stoan's side with Bade is one of my favorite parts of the story. To hear him rip in a hop right where it hurts makes you rightfully angry, but when he's later cast out by someone he clearly sees as a father figure, it doesn't feel like the sweet revenge you craved either. It's pretty emotional stuff for a Pokemon game, and a really intriguing conflict between the main cast. Most importantly, Sword and Shield makes sure you know Rose is the root. He's the root. Most importantly, Sword and Shield makes sure you know Rose is the root cod- The root cod. Most importantly, Sword and Shield makes sure you know Rose is the root cause of it all. So why does the game suddenly want to depict him as the tragic, misguided hero of the story? Don't get me wrong, I am completely in love with morally grey antagonists, and I know that a well-written character should be much more than bad and good. The greatest characters in fiction can do wrong by some characters and right by others. If I had it my way, all Pokemon villains would be shown in a much greyer light to spice things up. But when a character isn't properly set up to be more than one-dimensional, it feels jarring when the story wants to make them that way. Based on all the scenes he was depicted in, was Rose's dramatic final boss music battle and scenario earned? From the perspective of someone who was incredibly invested in Sword and Shield initially, the battle felt kind of cringe. There's no other word I can use to describe it. In the end, the player and Hop stop Rose and save the legendary Pokemon he's attempting to use to fix Galar's future energy problem, and things just go back to normal. So Leon says his final speech about improving for the sake of the future generation, but it's in direct contrast with what just happened in the story, and that future problem is never addressed again. <laughs> what? <laughs> I just can't help but feel like Rose was not supposed to be a character like that, and for whatever reason they had to rush to get whatever they could out before writing was finished. Pokemon Sword and Shield's story suffers from a severe lack of coherency. It's predictable, but not in a way that helps it make sense. It has the setup for a story which isn't paid off, and the payoff of a story that wasn't set up. As a result, its finale not only feels empty, but forced and unplanned. Despite sharing a similar emptiness, something is clearly very different between Rose's twist villainy and Volo's. Volo's fight is equally if not more epic in execution, but somehow it doesn't feel wrong. Why then does Legends Finale still lack the emotional weight that another important Pokemon story managed to impart so easily? Again, I find myself at a loss for words, this time for positive reasons. I can't hide my bias for Pokemon Black and White. Although I played a few of the games prior to it, I was a Gen 5 kid at heart. I think it may have had to do with the fact that I had reading figured out by then. Although you might not have been able to tell because I somehow managed to misspell my own name. For the longest time, my save file in Pokemon Black and White was called Lukui. Nostalgic experiences aside, I truly believe Pokemon Black and White and Black and White 2 was the peak of Pokemon, at least in writing, if not in all other aspects. It was the first time in a game where my younger self was so invested in a character that I openly wept when it was time to say goodbye to him. I still do a little, and is something of an enigma in Pokemon. He's like the holy grail of writing that the entire team at Game Freak has decided never to touch again for fear of marring his legacy. As a result, the scene in Black and White where he says his farewell to the player truly feels like a goodbye, a close to a character arc skillfully constructed from beginning to end. He appears again in Black and White 2, the first and only sequel to a mainline Pokemon game, because it was just that good, baby, but just for a brief, bittersweet moment, only a short confirmation that he has indeed changed since the player last saw him. He's never been seen again or mentioned since, aside from his non-canon spin-offs. Even then, his appearances are few and far between. He's never been seen. Bro is lost. Have you seen this man? He's disappeared. Pokemon Black and White's core conflict is not of good versus evil, but of conflicting ideals. The game's resident evil organization the game's resident evil organization? The game's resident evil organization, Team Plasma, follows a man named Getsus, an extremist in the belief that Pokemon should be freed from human control and liberated back into the wild. The organization itself brings up a question that players of the series had been asking, albeit jokingly, for a long time. Is it immoral to take these animals from their habitats to raise them, especially for the sake of battle? Although Team Plasma takes their beliefs to criminal ends like kidnapping and other forms of violence, their message touches the 
parts of the people it spreads to. Citizens and trainers alike begin to ask the same question, and some do release their Pokemon. They're like the vegans of Pokemon. The counter-argument made by trainers like Alder, the champion of the Unova region, and the player character's close friends Charon and Bianca is that the bond between Pokemon and people is one that has been forged over centuries of working, playing, and battling alongside one another. There are Pokemon and people who truly need each other. It's a touching way of breaking the fourth wall to reach the player's heart, who was undoubtedly one in millions of people who have been shaped by this franchise since childhood. The story does not deny the existence of either type of Pokemon, the ones that enjoy and want the company of people and others who have been hurt by it. When the player meets N for the first time in black and white, they aren't aware that he is the game's main antagonist. Still, that doesn't stop him from prattling on about his goals and ideals. He comes across as creepy and dangerous, and he's under the impression that his beliefs are the only truth, similar to Getsus and the rest of Team Plasma. The most important thing the player learns about N is that he has the ability to understand the voices of Pokemon. Upon each encounter with N, he asks to hear the voices of the player's partners in action because he is of the assumption that they will despise the player. In return, he informs informs them of an old legend about a dragon Pokemon that was split in two during a war between two kings, two heroes vying for control. One dragon represents truths, and the other represents ideals. N claims that when the conflict between Team Plasma and their discreditors comes to a head, these two dragons will rise again to fight for the two opposing sides. Of course, N's allegiances don't stay a secret for long. When the player meets him for the third time, he invites them to talk. There, he discloses who he is, not the leader, but the king of Team Plasma. Plasma, a figurehead. The player then watches him help with the getaway of a few Team Plasma members and battles against him. Suddenly, N's empty threat that one of the legendary dragons will assist Team Plasma has weight, because he is pursuing the being himself. Obviously, the player takes it upon themselves to recruit the other legendary dragon and fight against N and Team Plasma. The player encounters N a few more times before both of them acquire their respective dragons. After that, the player and their allies attack Team Plasma at its base, its self-proclaimed castle, where the player is eventually split apart from their group and left to explore the castle and find N on their own. During their exploration, the player has the chance to talk to many of the members of Team Plasma, who explain how important the cause and their king is to them. They want the player and N to face off, and for their king to win in battle to prove their ideals to be the truth once and for all. Their ambition is admirable, but it is shown in a new light upon discovering one of the rooms on the upper floor of the castle, a child's room. It's brightly lit with vivid colors, countless toys, and accompanied by a disturbing distorted music box melody. Eventually, it dawns on the player what happened here. N, taken in by Getsus at a young age, was raised alongside hurt and abused Pokemon in order to indoctrinate him into the unwavering role of representative, king of Team Plasma. In doing so, Team Plasma would have a leader so charismatic and steadfast in their beliefs that the group could unite under him. For the first time in the history of Pokemon villains, it's sad. Because the plot has been laid out during exchanges with the villains prior to this moment, the game is able to wordlessly communicate the backstory of its main antagonist and explain why he's so close-minded. The cruelty of humans toward these creatures is all he's ever been allowed to know. As the player approaches the throne room where N waits with his newly acquired dragon companion, N begins to question Team Plasma and Getsus. The player wasn't the only one learning through their interactions. N also starts to see the full picture. Upon leaving the castle walls for the first time at the beginning of the game, N met countless different Pokemon and people. When he challenged the player for the first few times to hear their partner Pokemon's voices, he only heard how those Pokemon wanted to be with them. The longer his journey continued, the more unsure he became. He continually saw things that contradicted predicted what he thought he knew. Still, he resolves to fight the player, to leave it up to a battle between the heroes to decide which of them deserves to enforce their ideals. After the player defeats N, he concedes that the ideals they pursue must be stronger than his. 
but he finally begins to understand the story's core message when he wonders if both heroes chosen by the dragons could have been right in their respective beliefs, that maybe neither was wrong. He's interrupted by Getsus upon his defeat, however, which begs the question, if N is the king of Team Plasma, where does that leave Getsus? As it turns out, Getsus actually sought to liberate Pokemon to take them from Unova's people and keep them for himself. He ruled Team Plasma in the shadows, manipulating their king to unknowingly do his bidding. He planned to appeal to the public's emotions in order to weaken them and be the sole strongest in Unova, easily taking control of the region. Getsus challenges the player in a final effort to rid Team Plasma of them, but with N's help, they take him down. Upon Getsus' betrayal, N accepts that his close-mindedness was a result of being raised to fill the role of a king for Team Plasma. Despite that, the champion Alder sees that N wasn't acting solely on Getsus' manipulation, but because his heart was truly inspired. The beliefs he held aren't depicted as the evil the player must overcome. Many others in Team Plasma come to a similar conclusion. The liberation of Pokemon is something they genuinely believed in. What makes our ideals different is how we interpret the truth. The environment you grow up in and your exposure to certain things dictates your beliefs. But does that mean those beliefs are any less real? This is what the game means by truths and ideals. Unlike black and white, they don't always need to be in contrast with each other. The two kings may have split the dragons apart during their war, but they were always meant to be one. No idealistic approach to one truth is wrong, and it's only in learning to accept all interpretations that we can understand others and make a difference. That's some big dig shit, Pokemon, what? <laughs> this is why N changes dragons between versions of the game. They both suit him. Reshiram, for the multifaceted truth he comes to terms with throughout the story, and Zekrom, for the ideals he holds on to regardless. Finally, Getsus is apprehended and the ordeal comes to a close, and is left with the player where they have one final conversation. There, he admits everything that he foolishly ignored along his journey that proved him wrong. That really, it was he who didn't understand Pokemon. Ignoring the voices of things he didn't want to hear wasn't making them any less real. After being pardoned by Elder and the player, N says he's going to find a new purpose for himself, somewhere he can meet all kinds of different Pokemon and people. Before leaving, he advises the player to make their dream a reality, even if it opposes his. He realizes now that he can't change what the player's beliefs have culminated into, but that he can chase his own truth to realize his own ideal world, a world where Pokemon and people live happily, free to choose their own fate. Such is the scene that made many young gamers weep. Ironically, in the games called Black and White, a morally gray character is done very well. I can't help but think that was on purpose. N has both the proper setup and payoff of a good antagonist, and embodies the theme of the game perfectly instead of contradicting it to no end. Not only that, but Getsus, a twist villain in his own right, progresses naturally and is believable. Black and White had a message it wanted to portray and it didn't stray from it. Buried just under the surface of every single interaction between the main characters is a reference to this message, and it creates the impact of the game's finale. Most importantly, this finale centerpiece, N, is given ample time and proper dialogue to foreshadow the climax of his journey. Pokemon Black and White may not be the greatest story ever told, but it shows a level of competency in writing that Pokemon had never achieved before and can't seem to achieve again.
With all that in mind, let's step away from antagonists for a moment to scrutinize legends the way we just did with Sword and Shield in black and white. I believe that when critiquing a story in the way I'm about to, it's important to understand and retain the original meaning behind the plot. There's little point in changing the purpose of a story. If I were to do that, I might as well just go work on my own instead. So what is Legends trying to say? What is the moral? Pokemon Legends tries to tell a story about coexistence and unity. In that way, it is very similar to Pokemon Black and White. The main plot surrounds two ancient tribes, the Diamond Clan and the Pearl Clan, which existed in ancient times. Both of them worship a god known as Almighty Sinnoh, but they have conflicting beliefs over the fundamentals of what this god is. The Diamond Clan, currently led by a man named Adamant, believes Almighty Sinnoh resides over time, and that nothing could exist without the flowing of time. The Pearl Clan, led by its newly appointed leader Irida, thinks Almighty Sinnoh is the creator and protector of space. Not outer space, space as in everything tangible. And that space is the centerpiece of all creation. They are currently in a shaky truce, but in the past, as silly as their differences may seem to people generations ahead of them, the two clans have gone to war over their religious beliefs. The knowledge the two clans have lost to time, however, is that their gods are just that, two separate deities. Dialga is the protector of time in Hisui, and Palkia is the protector of Hisui's land. The closest being to the true almighty Sinnoh, an all-encompassing creator of everything, is Arceus, which only the player and Volo are aware of. Volo knows of Arceus and all of its myths due to being descended from an ancient group of Sinnoh people who worshipped Arceus. The player knows of Arceus because it sent them through the space-time rift. Soon after arriving in Hisui, the player is taken in by a third clan of sorts, the Galaxy Team, led by a man named Kamado. The Galaxy team recently migrated to Hisui to create a settlement where people can live safely separated from Pokemon. There, the player observes, with an outward perspective, the conflict between the Diamond and Pearl clans, and helps them come to terms with the other's opposing faith. They also teach the citizens living under the Galaxy team how to coexist with Pokemon, and slowly integrate them into everyday life in the village. Like Sword and Shield, Legend's message is nicely woven into its large cast of characters, which mostly consists of the Wardens of Hisui's two clans. The Wardens are people who are dedicated to serving the pacifistic Noble Pokemon, and in return, the Nobles protect the clans. The player must interact with the Wardens on their journey to calm the Nobles after the rift in space-time frenzies them. We first see Legend's message about coexistence shine within Calaba of the Pearl Clan and Erezu of the Diamond Clan. The player character assists Calaba, someone who is very serious about her allegiance to her clan, and teaches her the importance of trusting people outside of it. Calaba is nearly a century old and has been with the Pearl Clan all her life. Her values are equally as old, but the player learns that her staunch tribalism is not out of a hatred for the opposing clan, but rather a passionate love of her own. Calaba clearly grows when she is willing to assist Erezu, someone who is of the opposing clan. Paulina and Iskan don't need any help learning the value of unity. The two of them are of opposing clans, but after the tragic death of the noble Paulina protects, they fell in love. They have a respect for each other and their beliefs, and Iskan encourages Paulina to stay strong in the face of persecution by her own clan due to her noble's death. They can't openly be in a relationship because of the tension between the tribes, but after the clan's misconceptions are resolved, the two of them can be seen together in a brief post-credits illustration. The Cobalt Coastlands plot is the most engaging and meaningful act in the game, following the two of them to assist the deceased noble Pokemon's child to grow to take his place. Along with highlighting the unity of these two opposites, it also gives some insight into Irida by using the noble's successor to represent the young leader's similarly unfortunate situation. I'll get to that in a moment. One of the nobles of the familiar Mount Coronet is protected by Warden Ingo, an equally familiar character. Ingo is the same as the player character. He was sent back in time from modern Unova. And he's bald! He's bald! He's bald! However, he has also lost pieces of his memory. Players who have played black and white will recognize him, but he is noticeably missing his metaphorical other half, his brother Emmett. Ingo is the antithesis of Legend's theme. He is someone who was separated from his counterpart, and now he must exist without them. Without Emmett next to Ingo to contrast his pose and colors, something is missing. The two of them are opposites that need to coexist to give them purpose, much like they were in black and white. 
Game Freak chose the perfect character to be sent back alongside the player in that regard. Black and White still managing to carry the story even when it's hundreds of years in the past? Because he is also from the future, Ingo is a natural at battles and is one of the few characters capable of wielding a full team of Pokemon. He and the player face off in an attempt to help Ingo remember the future he came from. These characters are fundamental to building Legend's story and message. Using the precedent Black and White created, each character in interaction should act as a piece of a bigger puzzle that will be completed in the finale. I believe Legend's was halfway there. Many of these characters have fun personalities and fitting roles, but they were not given proper moments which would fully immerse the player and allow them to fully experience their stories. Again, all of what I've laid out makes logical sense, yet its lack of emotional finality causes it to fall very short of the height of Pokemon's writing. Through examining the moments where these characters shine, as well as my examples from past games, I think I've pieced together why this is. What makes Legends so painfully inoffensive? Wonderful stuff, Benny. Much obliged. Your potato mochi never fails to please. <laughs> what the fuck? That sounds disgusting. Where exactly did you find our visitor here? You know that great hole in the sky? The one people call the space-time rift? Uh -huh. Our new friend fell right out it's of it. It's true, I was there. I've been briefed on your situation, including how you fell from the rift in the sky. Don't expect a warm welcome from everyone. Naturally, some will be slow to trust an outsider who literally fell right out of Okay, that makes sense, yeah. Remember that you are a stranger who appeared one day out of the very sky above yeah, us. Right. People are naturally suspicious of your presence uh -huh. here. He successfully caught three Pokemon! Three of them in quick order, you Too understand. true. You are a stranger to us. One who fell out of the very sky. So carry on with your okay. research and yeah, survey sorry, duties and prove that you are truly an asset to us. Roaches! That beautiful flowing fit of gymnastics is what we call a dodge. Your fellow Survey Corps members are likely at the Wallflower. Go All right, let's them. go. Benny, old chum, the usual order. Three servings of potato mochi, please. Same thing? Okay. Oh, and if there's anything else that you'd recommend, by all means, bring it out. Potato mochi tastes so much better when you have something to I'm be sure happy about. I'm sure it's terrible, usually. I dare say he was well prepared, and he was a quick study of how yeah, Cleaver worked in battle, though. from what I heard. Thanks, man. I have a new mission Are you gonna for yell you. at me again? I order you to study Ursa Luna in the Crimson Mire Lens. Hey, period! Five sec- if you notice that today's potato mochi tastes a bit different, does it ever get old making the same As thing I every time we come here? Why is he with Pokemon? Shouldn't he be with Kamado and hating them? Yeah, I get it. I did fall right out of the Listen sky. Listen well, you must quell any Pokemon that could cause harm to the people the blue of the suit. Your next okay. orders are to begin the survey of the Cobalt Coast. Okay. This feels a lot like hell. Captain Magma! Get him angry and he's bound to erupt! Krakatawa! Dinner's on Commodo tonight. Eat your fill. Do you ever what eat an anything else? Aroma. It's almost like a fairy tale, isn't it? How you've fallen to us from the sky and gone on to help the people. I know! Of so much. You must go to the Coronet Highlands to quell another frenzied noble. Am I in a Electrode, hollow lord. <laughs> Dark souls? You must be tired. Go on then, to the wall flower. No, no, get some rest, no, no, don't make me I've instructed go. Benny to prepare you his finest potato mochi. Thanks for this nice, sizable helping of potato mochi, He's literally Benny. literally already said this before. Oh, and if there's anything else you recommend, he bring said it on this out. before. The only lord Just left send me out there, bro. is Avalug, which lives in the Alabaster Icelands. No matter how many of these frenzied Pokemon you may quell, the fact remains that you are Shut a stranger up! to our world. No small number of people still regard you with suspicion and distrust. Can you tell that I'm talking about myself yet? Oh, these are pretty cool bananas. <gasps> To think, peace would be restored to Hisui by the hand of our mysterious Riftborn helper. Go nourish yourself with the wallflower and allow your. How many times have I been under attack by some frenzied noble this very moment if he hadn't come falling out of the sky to us? Shut the fuck up, you cunt! What of the dream I first shared with you on Prelude? What have you ever done to complete the Pokedex? He's forcing it on me. I never said that shit. I never said that. What does this man? Do for the player beyond eating potato mochi with them and occasionally rehashing that they fell out of the sky. What do we know about these two that makes this feel genuine? 
Look who's being punctual. Oh, is this the clan leader? Finally leaders? realized you're wasting Almighty Sinnoh's precious time by bowing to a <laughs> sham. <laughs> time joke. So they're fighting over religions? There you go again, insisting on your false image of Almighty Sinnoh as a ruler yep. of time. My people follow the true Almighty Sinnoh, the font of all creation and the ruler of space. You could have all the space there is and still not know what yeah, to do with it. Yeah, I get it. it. Excuse me? Are you really suggesting that you make better use of your time than we make use of Bro, will Kisui's you stop? best space? Me? Get lost? In Almighty Sinnoh's great gift to the Pearl Clan? Bro, In our why, are they, very why are they doing this? You can feel the tension when those two show up. Can you? I was just watching a sitcom. Okay, I stop again. Any drink? <laughs> Reminder, these people went to war? Tension would be vague insults mumbled under breath or reluctantly civil and forced greetings. It, hell, tension would be if they both pulled up with a bunch of members of their clans behind them as a precaution. How cool would that have been? Weren't they at war? Aren't we trying to stress that one wrong move will cause an outbreak between the two clans and that none of us want that? Why have the player's first impression of these characters be a silly pun off? Their conversations should be much more insightful and professional than this. The point of this scene, like Akari says, is to underline the tension between the two clans. In fact, there are a few lines that, when ejected from the rest of the conversation, I actually think are okay. Without the rest of the scene setting this silly tone, it's clearly hostile and makes a dumb space-time joke much more subtly. Irida is level-headed and serious, almost to the point of trying too hard, and Adamant doesn't see her as a good leader. The player understands, or at least will come to understand, what their conflict of interest is, so play around with their personal dynamic instead. It's so strange because the scene immediately after this is just fine. It's like they made the clan leader's first scene silly and tone deaf on purpose, or the scenes were written by two completely different people with wildly different images of the story. In fact, this problem can be observed on a smaller scale with characters tones of voice. Adamin, for example, is consistently jumping from unnaturally proper to very casual, regardless of who he's speaking with, and it leads to a constantly fluctuating understanding of what his personality is. Never let them know your next move. These inconsistencies and the lack of any definitive progression as characters interact gives the impression that multiple different people wrote the dialogue for characters' interactions, with little communication between writers. Or at the very least, like, translation things. If I could read Japanese, I would love to check if the dialogue in this game is a translation thing. A dialogue. It's dialogue, that's the problem. How about you shut up about that damn diamond and get some good dialogue? All of the characters I listed earlier are somehow negatively affected by Legend's inability to make its characters say words in a way that is interesting and convincing, or put them in a scenario where they can be portrayed as characters who do more than one thing in one place. Caliba doesn't get nearly enough time to properly establish herself as a person and then grow and change into something new as a result of the player's positive actions. So she has to encroach on other characters' already limited screen time for exposition to pretend like her change didn't come out of left field. Caliba is too old to make her own character arc, so Volo has to help her cross the writing street. Even though what Volo said helps, it also creates more problems. How can she possibly switch a lifetime of opinions to the complete opposite solely because some dude gave her a piece of wall. Also, Erezu all but disappears after her role with Calaba is over. She's barely her own character. Her cuts were literally just bald and squire anyway, like seek a different career girl. Give me the founding father. The Cobalt Coastlands plot is the least offensive in this regard, but it still lacks a cohesive ending. An inclusion in the post-credits illustration isn't the proper conclusion this concept deserved. Ingo also never gets closure. We never see him remember his old life, and he simply waffles off, never to be seen again. Ingo doesn't get a say in the closing of the space-time rift either, meaning players also trap him in this time period, not just themselves. This would be fine if he was present during the finale to at least acknowledge this, but again, once these characters tell half of their stories and leave, they don't come back. These are four of the more interesting characters in Legends, so it goes to follow that they have some engaging dialogue, but their severe lack of dialogue, lack of any presence at all after the player moves on to the next area makes them completely fall off and their stories become inconclusive. I once again find myself wondering if I was inferring everything about these plot lines, because otherwise it seems obvious that they should have some sort of thematically important ending that lends quality to 
to the game's finale. There is a world of difference between having a creative team and storytelling. As far as I know, Game Freak hasn't hired a writer for their games in forever, aside from spin-offs for some reason. They're competent in making concepts for their games, but don't execute them properly. They have a solid creative team, but no one knows how to portray those ideas in a well-paced, digestible way. Honestly, it's a miracle Black and White came out as well as it did, all things considered. A bit of shocking information I discovered upon re-examining Black and White for the purpose of this analysis. N only appears in the entire game a total of seven times. Seven! They had to optimize every moment he gets with the player and every moment he is mentioned outside of his interactions with the player to pull off the emotional ending they were shooting for. Clearly, if it worked, there was something in those seven interactions that Game Freak did right. Imagine if they pulled a rose with N, where he instead appeared seven times to deliver the most unspecific, pointless lines, all while acting vaguely mean, <laughs> and then tried to pull off N's farewell as if it had been earned. You may be able to assume what N believed, but it would be a possible to feel the emotional weight of the scene. Dialogue is doubly important for interactions between characters who have particularly interesting dynamics or aren't often seen together. Take N's fourth encounter, for example, where he talks with the Pokemon professor, Professor Juniper. They bounce off of each other quite well. He makes a snide remark about her career, how it treats Pokemon like objects to be studied in group rather than treated like individuals. She returns with a collected and more mature response with undertones of the game's core message, and boom! we've aided in setting up the core conflict and where it is going to develop with only a few lines of dialogue. Although I must admit, it would have been preferable to have more natural interactions with this integral character rather than seven straight to the point ones, given a few of them are a bit on the nose. But so many cutscenes may have interrupted the flow of gameplay and seven obviously serves its purpose. The peak of Pokemon's writing wasted no time with its scenes. When there was a moment with two characters who have a unique dynamic, they seized the opportunity. Interactions between characters written to be foils or who had contrasting beliefs were stuck in the ring and made to duke it out verbally. When Legends has a scene like that, the characters barely acknowledge each other at all. If they do, it's almost always meaningless, like Irida and Adamant's pointless pun-offs, when their followings have actually gone to war before, or when Volo and the clan leader of the player's choice investigate the Lake Guardian Pokemon and they barely say a word to each other despite Volo's unique insight into the clan's gods and the third party beliefs he holds. I also had no clue that Kamado and Benny had a connection until Benny tells the player last minute, despite the fact that it is implied, again implied, why can't it just be said, that the player is sent to the Wallflower where Benny works so he can spy on them on Kamado's behalf. That I didn't even realize until my sister picked up on it after the game was over. The strongest characters in Legends, in my opinion, are Kamado and Irida. You know, you wouldn't believe it with the extravagant performances I just had to put on. <coughs> anyway, I believe Game Freak achieved what they were going for with Volo with Kamado, who is a twist antagonist as well. Kamado explains his ideology to you a multitude of times, maybe too many times, and you experience and understand that ideology firsthand. Kamado left his home after it was destroyed by raging Pokemon to establish the Galaxy Team in Jubilife Village, safely guarded from Pokemon. He leads citizens and teammates alike and believes himself to be their sole protector. When the player character appears out of the space time rift that suddenly opened and made life in Hisui even more difficult, he is quick to question them. So when the rift worsens and Kamado ultimately banishes what he believes to be the cause, you can empathize with him. Then, after fighting Benny, he explains to you what happened to Kamado in his old home and encourages the player to try to change Kamado's fearful outlook. But Kamado suffers in the same way as the other characters. A lack of standout moments make him feel somewhat empty in the grand scheme of the story. The majority of his lines are simply there to push along the plot and give the player their next goal, rather than to establish his character and motivations. This is true for all but two scenes, one where he introduces new migrants to Jubilife and another where he banishes the player from Jubilife. But just those two outlying scenes and Benny's description of their past does wonders for Kamado and instantly puts him on a higher plane of complexity than many of the other important cast members. And this is still the bare minimum. Oh wow, you guys tried to tell me your story instead of me making it up in my brain? Real shit. Irida has some pretty advanced writing techniques for a Pokemon game, i.e. symbolism and 
character development. Irida believes she's inferior to Paulina. She believes Paulina should have been the one chosen to lead the Pearl Clan. The game compares the two girls with the Warden's Growliths, who have a noticeable discrepancy in physical and mental strength. The difference between the Growliths is so prevalent that the girls' only group of bandits, the Misfortunes, mistake the larger Growlithe for the late noble's replacement in their attempt to kidnap it. Irida also feels guilty for how the clan now treats Paulina after the death of said noble. However, she remains steadfast in her bias toward the Pearl Clan due to her own feelings of inadequacy. Because Irida became the leader when she was young and inexperienced, she relied only on following the Pearl Clan's old methods, which included distrust of and outright war toward the Diamond Clan. Eventually, she learns to follow her own heart and comes to terms with the opposing tribe. She initially distrusts the player, but this distrust turns on its head to become unwavering faith. Irida leaves the fate of the vast Hisui she loves so much in the player's hands, and also learns to trust and respect Adamin and the rest of the Diamond Clan. I believe these elements make Irida the most well-written character among the cast. She is realistic, understandable, and has good emotional development, all of which is fed to the player at a fine pace. The same can't be said of Adamin. Despite being the opposing clan leader and one of two main characters in Legends, Adamin sadly doesn't have much to him and falls flat in comparison to Irida, who has plenty of development to her name. That isn't to say Adamin doesn't get as much screen time. The screen time he does get is just severely less important or impactful. Maybe it's because Adamin has less interesting wardens to bounce off of that he seems underdeveloped when compared to Irida, but that's a problem in itself. The Pearl Clan has Irida, Paulina, and Ingo, but the Diamond Clan is severely lacking in standout characters. Even the clan settlements, which are populated only by NPCs, have a severe character-relevant dialogue discrepancy. Young Irida started training to become the clan leader when she was barely out of infancy. She's Irida never had anyone her age to play with. But I think well, it would have been she was fine chosen to as our clan Paulina leader very young. Irida was so young when her mother the left poor us. Poor girl can't even recall her mother's face. Did you know Adamant is Mai's little brother? No, actually. I didn't. <laughs> That's all there is. They could have told me Adamin's favorite color was purple for all that my matters. The dialogue of the common unnamed NPC, while perhaps not being as important as named characters' lines, will set the tone of a story. Background characters in a unique scenario or part of a unique group of characters fill the role of players experiencing something themselves. They must be used liberally to give a foundation to those scenarios in the world the player experiences. Many NPCs do a decent job at this, mostly in Jubilee Village. Others fall victim to a common an issue with Pokemon dialogue, present even with important named characters. They spend their limited time explaining a mechanic of gameplay instead of story-relevant perspectives that only they can share. That isn't to say it's impossible for characters to give gameplay tips. For example, the first time the player encounters a Pearl Clan member, they are in the Obsidian Fieldlands, the first area of the game. The clan member is, therefore, a point of intrigue for the player, but all he tells them is that it's possible for Pokemon to leap out of trees and fight them, something the player has most likely already experienced. This gives the subconscious impression that the clan members aren't all that important and aren't any different than the people the player meets in Jubilife. This character's unique perspective should be used to give a glimpse into life in the Pearl Clan. Instead of simply asking the player, have you come across a tree shaking and swaying? He could give a more meaningful piece of dialogue, like... I was sent to forage for berries out here and wild Pokemon keep leaping out of the trees at me. I ask for a reassignment, but Irida is too stubborn to give this job to someone with more battle experience. Gives a whole new impression, right? Once again, we're utilizing both this person's unique perspective to give insight into life in the Pearl Clan, and also what outward dialogue we're given to discuss more important characters in other environments. In this case, how Irida leads her clan. Pokemon Legends doesn't have the best visual performance, so world building that way can be difficult. However, some of my favorite stories in video games have excellent world building solely by virtue of dialogue with random bystanders. Even Sword and Shield managed this much. For a game about balance and coexistence, Legends sure has a hard time properly distributing important and unimportant screen time to their characters. Disclaimer that I mean no disrespect. I don't want this to come across as an I fixed it and I'm better uh, plus L and ratio type of upload. I just want to address and provide a few other solutions to some of the problems I felt were present in this story. There's no point in critiquing if you just change the whole damn thing, so what I'm not about to do is write a fan fiction. I just want to suggest a few tools that could help make this stronger in my opinion. Remember that this is meant to help exercise my writer's brain, so I like to take every chance I get to create as well as analyze. But if you do get the urge to write a fanfiction with my suggestions, uh, send it to me. <laughs>
With that in mind, let's try to create a more perfect world, shall we? Oh, am I almost there? I got seven more pages. I can do this. Okay. Let's return to our first example, the final battle against Volo. Again, there's merit in keeping the main message in mind while offering solutions. This finale is fittingly the apex and most extreme case of Pokemon Legends core theme, the quintessence of the player's emotional journey. The final confrontation asks if, given the choice, we should be forced to live alongside pain. Is it possible to coexist with suffering? Judging by the outcome, it seems like Legends wants to say that we should, because as a result of recreating a world to be absent of suffering, the world we live in now would cease to exist, metaphorically and literally in this case. If there were no pain or hardship to overcome, no one would be the same as before. It's the equivalent of hitting the self-destruct button to put everyone out of their misery, regardless of that misery's severity, just to start over with a blank canvas where everyone experiences life the same way and believes the same things. There is no longer any need to coexist or to improve and learn. To some people, that might not sound like such a bad idea, but to others it would be dystopian hence a complex antagonist. Clearly, if all this makes sense, but just lacks proper flushing out, there is something that can be added or changed to make its emotional beats work. The key lies in the dialogue and properly allocating the time each character is given. Compared to the seven appearances of Pokemon Black and White's antagonist, I can recall 13 times in which the player encounters Volo. Two of those encounters, he is actively meant to accompany them for about an hour or so of gameplay. That is about 20 minutes of N, a pretty generous estimate, versus over an hour of potential screen time with Volo. And I may be forgetting a few scenes. What was he written to be doing all this time? Uh, not much. This is probably not a good idea. As previously stated, Volo's role in the main story mostly consists of giving the player gameplay tips or progressing the plot using his knowledge about the legendary Pokemon. When he isn't doing either of those things, he appears to explain other characters' motives and personalities, like with Calaba and Ingo, instead of those characters portraying themselves. Although this serves to make the player trust and like Volo, it leaves him with very little time to establish himself as a person with his own beliefs. For a character so bent on destroying the world, World, you'd think he'd have some sort of opinion about it, but it doesn't seem like he does. He knows Arceus exists and clearly has some strong thoughts on it, but doesn't hold any particular feelings toward the clans that conveniently forgot about the god. He helps the player after they're banished from Jubilee Village, but doesn't think anything of the Galaxy team afterward. He doesn't have much of an opinion on Kogita either, even though she appears to be the person closest to him. When she pokes fun at him, he just stares at her like when she hits you with that dollar store pepper spray and doesn't respond once. Whether it's his feeling on the conflict between the clans and the galaxy team, or the people who would be caught in the crossfire of his actions, like the player, Adamant, Irida, Kamado, Kogita, he makes no mention of his thoughts on anything. You could argue this is in an attempt to hide his true intentions for the sake of the twist, but I'd argue back that any sort of opinion he could give on his qualms with the state of the world wouldn't make him any more sus than he already was. Let's be honest, most of us already had a hunch that he was evil. It was only because they waited until post-game to reveal it it, which is sort of brilliant by the way, that anyone was surprised. Plus, him being more open and honest with the player would probably make him less suspicious. What's more important is the meaning of his betrayal, which in an attempt to hide it becomes muddled. I shouldn't be none the wiser purely because I wasn't emotionally invested in you, that's what Rose did. There's only so much of a twist villain that you can bank on being both suspiciously hot and nice. Isn't it depressing that that's what makes him feel like he's being fake rather than him expressing odd, dissatisfied beliefs with the world as it is, given those beliefs wouldn't have felt too out of place in Legends setting if done right when compared to a character like Lysander. I must create a world more beautiful than our own. What are you trying to say about France? Sucks that we have to get mauled by bears every day after taking a step off the porch. Also, your god is not real. What? That's essentially my solution. Not that the characters be given more screen time, but that the screen time they are given be more thoughtfully considered. For example, the first two times the player meets Volo, it is to teach them a mechanic. The first is battling, which I do find clever because it means he's both the first and last person you fight in the main story. And the second is backstriking, which is also pretty ironic considering where this friendship leads the player. Bro, bitch! No, you're not gonna call me no bitch because I'm not none of these women. I'm gonna whoop your ass! 
these are all fine, funny hints at what's to come, but it's also not clarifying his intentions in backstabbing the player. And chances are that the player already understands these mechanics fully well. As it stands, he still comes across as just another insane Pokemon villain, and I think he might be more than that. During those encounters or others with less meaning behind them, like when he's briefly seen a third time in Jubilife, why not put him and the player in a more telling situation where they can learn more about his motives and him as a person, rather than just hint at his role in the story? So while he's in Jubilife, take the opportunity to have him react to something that makes life hard for people here, like Galaxy Team members injured from the aftermath of the Cleaver incident. Apparently some of them were hospitalized after being mauled by the frenzied noble after all. Or given Volo's cover as a Ginkgo Guild merchant, he could have a passing glum comment about how supplies in Jubilife are dwindling. The player then leaves this conversation with the knowledge that Volo is an empathetic type of person who recognizes that times are difficult. This scene in-game is also where he establishes that he's a bit of a legend fanatic, and that still checks out since the player just defeated one of the ten nobles of legend. Then comes the scene where he explains Caliba's character arc for her. I realize I harp on this a lot for some reason, it's really not that bad. I just frequently use it as an example. It's indicative of a greater problem. Assuming in this hypothetical world Caliba can do that herself, she's a grown woman after all, this is an interesting opportunity to learn what Volo thinks of the clans. Does he dislike them because of the issues their needless conflicts have caused in the past? Is he upset that they've forgotten about Arceus and Giratina, and have misconceptions about Dialga and Palkia? Any of this seems reasonable and continues to establish a belief that Volo holds, which he will later take to extreme measures. Skipping ahead a few scenes, all of which would hopefully continue the trend of meeting Volo and discussing his interest in mythical beings, and the player's role in those myths, as well as encountering more unfortunate situations which seem to be as a direct result of the reign of these legends, we arrive at the player's banishment from Jubilife. Not only does Volo helping the player here still make a lot of sense, the two of them also have a closer bond as a result of having more in-depth, open conversations. To pose this question again, is Volo upset by Commodore's decision? It's important to ask what a character is feeling in every scene so they can act accordingly and in line with what we already know about them. In this case, it seems more accurate to believe he would empathize with Commodo and the rest of Jubilife. After all, Volo is taking the most extreme action of all to enact what he sees as protecting humanity. The two of them meet with Kogita and after are shortly joined by Adam and an Irida. Looking back to the example from Black and White where Anne and Juniper got in a flaming match, among other scenes, this opportunity where all these characters are together should be seized. As previously established, it seems logical to believe that Volo would either be indifferent to or actively dislike the two clans. The same can be said of Kogita, who, in-game, recognizes just how naive the two leaders are. So when in the presence of these leaders, it would make sense for Volo and Kogita to talk about why they feel that way, which includes their ancestry. Although this is actually only divulged in the post-game conflict, it's an important aspect to both of their characters and should be given more time to simmer in the player's mind. I think their ancestry being said near the finale is an interesting enough twist. This change wouldn't just benefit Volo, either. Assuming Irida is the same as she is in-game, she's had her character development and could provide some interesting, thematically relevant counter-arguments to whatever Volo would say. Irida has just learned to come to terms with Adamant and the Diamond Clan's beliefs, after all. Adamant himself... I'm not too sure. I can guess what Game Freak was trying to do with Volo, but it's a bit more difficult with Adamant since he barely has any implied nuance to speak of. His most standout feature is that he seems much more confident in his role as a clan leader and he is quick to trust the player. I don't believe every character needs to go through some life-changing journey to make them interesting. Some people just have it all sorted. Still, that doesn't mean they're automatically going to be or should be unimportant. Considering those two aspects of his character, I could see him acting as a guide of sorts to Irida and being a large factor in more explicitly depicting her growth or challenging her old closed-mindedness. It would make sense that through his interactions with Irida, as she learns to grow and accept the wider world, the space, if you would, Adamin grows too. Slowly but surely, there are things even he could learn from Irida. Regardless of her beliefs or position, she has an outlook or a mindset that is valuable. I'm not sure. When presented with the choice to travel to the lakes alongside Volo and one of the clan leaders, I chose Adamin. I get it. I too like men. But when traveling, I couldn't help but feel like Irida earned those scenes more. Still, either one of them has the same interesting perspective about coexistence to share with our main antagonist. 
During the finale of the main story, I have to wonder why Volo isn't there. It doesn't throw a massive wrench into anything, but it seems like something that he has stakes in. He'd probably want to be there since it's his plot the player is foiling, even if they don't know it yet. Plus, it's just another missed opportunity for him to share interesting dialogue with characters like Kamado. I can't help but wonder if he wasn't there because they didn't want to make a cutscene model for him in his regular outfit. <laughs> That leads me to the post-game conflict, where all is revealed. I've already expressed my problem with Volo's dialogue in the finale. Game Freak once again takes the crazy guy route, while again, the perfect motive is merely implied in the background. In fact, the first thing Volo says upon starting to act strangely is completely different than those motives. Something about some anime ass backstory? As it stands, without any of the buildup I've fabricated, I'm actually glad they didn't explain what the hell he was talking about here, because then it really would have felt forced. Cringe, even, like Rose. Again, they would have paid off a story that hadn't been set up, but it's precisely because they left it open-ended that this finale could actually be interpreted. You don't think that's why they make their stories so vague, do you? I changed my mind. Game Freak should be even less specific. Just let me assume the whole plot for you. In fact, just let me take it. Just sell it to me. I want Pokemon. Anyway, there's nothing wrong with having a backstory that defines a character's current beliefs, just as long as it stems further than bad thing happened, therefore kill everything, which I believe this does. It's just yet another thing that should be mentioned earlier. Like when I said Volo and Kogita could talk about their relation to the ancient Sinnoh people with the clan leaders. Whatever he's referring to here could be divulged somehow, since that's already delving into to past territory. Careless lines have the potential to give a wildly different image of the conflict than what might be intended. In Spear Pillar, Volo makes no mention of why he's doing what he's doing in favor of explaining the cons of his own plan to the player. His explanation comes across as a taunt that effectively just gives the player some kind of motivation. But it can be tweaked to something more personal, something that makes it seem like he's actually trying to get the player to understand and agree with what he's doing. They've experienced the same tragedies that have recently befallen Hisui after all. All the suffering they've witnessed and tried to change can disappear with the wave of a hand, and in his eyes anything is worth that sacrifice. But because of what the player character has learned about the world of Hisui, and all of the people within it, they now understand the merit of coming to terms with what we dislike the opposite of Volo, and whatever's happened to him. We've established our own little all-encompassing arc here, so really there's not much that needs to change in this finale aside from small lines. Volo's betrayal inherently becomes more upsetting since the player genuinely got to know and trust him, but that also means they understand why he's trying to dethrone Arceus, and why they need to stop him. And so the battle ensues, now with all those aforementioned emotional aspects indubitably playing a part. Such is my uh, not-so-brief suggestion to improve this conflict. The same formula as a general rule can be applied to Legends as a whole. Volo, in-game, takes his ideology to an extreme before the player is aware he holds that ideology. The fight is one we can make sense of so it doesn't feel out of place, but it's also not one that we can fully understand and empathize with. This lack of emotional connection due to careless dialogue exchanges, I believe, is the core problem of Legends Arceus' story. But we can go deeper. If that rule can be applied, then let's apply it. A final hurrah of large veiny brainage. The what do lightning round. Laventon is the first character you come across. He's a part of the Galaxy team in which he leads a branch known as the Survey Corps. Get your laughs out now. As it stands, he and Akari, or Rei I guess, do fuck all. The two of them are only there to show the player the ropes and give some super brief world building. Laventon sides with the player when they are banished from Jubilee, joining Akari and Silene to see them out. To add weight to this, I believe he and Kamado could be somewhat at odds throughout the story. Laventon is a Pokemon professor after all, and Kamado wants nothing more than to remain fearful of and hateful toward these creatures who destroyed his home, not attempt to understand them. That also ties in with the core theme. Akari seems to want to be the player's rival, but I all but forgot about her by the end. Due to being part of what I like to call the wallflower scenes that blended into every other scene like some Kafkaesque nightmare with no merciful end in sight, I can't recall a single thing she said to me throughout the entire game. This unfortunately applies to both Laventon and Benny as well. If you were present at the wallflower during any of its moments, I'm convinced you came through some space-time rift of your own. Anyway, Akari struggles to keep up with the player because the player has the advantage of living in a time where a training Pokemon is the norm. Eventually, she just gives up and becomes a Minecrafter. I mean a crafter. She makes balls. A Pokeballs. This is a tough one. On one hand, it's easy enough to just slap a hop arc on her and say she has a talent for something else, but when it's a talent as inconsequential as crafting, it feels kinda lame. Maybe 
Maybe there could be a parallel drawn here between her and the modern day Sinnoh protagonist gender dependent rival, where she's actually closer to Kamado instead of Laventon. Taking the player's side against Kamado is now a more fitting end for her journey. It also gives something more for Akari and Laventon to talk about at the Wallflower. They have something to disagree on. Akari is a big proponent of Kamado, whereas Laventon might have his qualms about him. Benny, another sad victim of the Wallflower's crimes, also lacks any sort of indication that he might be important in his dialogue. Which is a shame, because I actually think he's really damn cool. If he was given a proper introduction, he might be up there in terms of favorites. As previously mentioned, Benny is a spy for Kamado, and a crazy ninja guy masquerading as an old dude running a restaurant. Benny is also an old friend of Kamado's, and lived in the same village as him when it was destroyed. As a result, he's very loyal and is apparently willing to kill the player to help him. That's awesome. At best, Benny's persona at the Wallflower is annoying. At worst, it is the main cause of the Wallflower paradox that makes it feel like the same scene over and over again. Thank Benny for the potato mochi, talk about how good the potato mochi is, and scene. To make Benny a more prevalent character who isn't just a single quirk, differentiate the Wallflower scenes. I could envision an exchange where Benny speaks with the player alone and imparts some sort of wisdom about the dangers of Pokemon. It would have a double meaning. One, because he genuinely believes in that danger and experienced it firsthand, and two, because he recognizes that any further integration of Pokemon into Jubilife might endanger the player because of Kamado's stigma. Additionally, I don't think it would be a bad idea for him to disclose what happened to the two of them earlier than on Mount Coronet. Benny does end up letting the player stop Kamado, so something of a mutual understanding between the two would be nice. This would make him stick out more in the player's mind, as well as make his betrayal have more weight beyond the initial shock of him being a guilt. I'm only going to return to Adamin for a second because there's not much to say. Again, he's much more confident and accepting than Irida, and I think that would ironically make him someone she can actively look up to. The contrast of going from her enemy to someone she genuinely respects is even more of a stark change now. Wrecking my brain for anything Adamin said that was important, I remembered he brought up his grandfather a number of times that was greater than one. That's clearly big. He seems important to him. Maybe Adamin's grandfather was the one who ended the war with the Pearl Clan a long time ago, and so he wants to be more like him. But that could potentially give some relevance to Mai as well, since they're apparently family. This is what leads him to be more confident and open as a leader. Similar to how members of the Pearl Clan settlement give exposition on Irida, people in the Diamond Clan settlement can talk about this. Actually, all the better if Adamin does it himself. But to drive this point home even further, half the Diamond and Pearl Clans actually engage in conflict for a brief act. This is foreshadowed heavily in conversations between Kamado, Irida, and Adamin, but it never actually happens. It would give a more conclusive ending to the conflict between the clans. Adamin and Irida seem to have improved their relationship just before the player quells the final noble, so perhaps the conflict would happen then. This would highlight many more aspects of these three characters due to a more stressful situation. We'd see Kamado choose a neutral alignment, which is what's best for the village, like he says he would. Irida would fall back on her clan's old ways for guidance, and Adamin would reluctantly give up on his ideals to lead like his grandfather or whatever, because his people are unwilling to listen. It doesn't have to be anything crazy, just a small spat where a few members or wardens of the clans fight each other, and the player could get involved in a few of these battles for fun. In the end, the clans would actually vocally discuss their differences and come out of their dispute better for it. A discussion and more distinguished change toward each other would also do wonders for the strength of the game's themes. There is then a definitive moment where the clans begin mending their relationship, and where things begin looking up for them. The misfortunes were super interesting, and I thought they were going to play a bigger part than they actually did. If you play close attention to the details of their designs, you'll notice that each of them has aspect of the different clans and teams. Clover has the Ginkgo Guild outfit and some elements from the Diamond Clan. Coin wears the Pearl Clan garb under her coat, and I think Charm wears something like the Galaxy Team uniform. The three of them were once separated by clan titles, but now they've united under felonies. This is a fine start, but it never had a moment to explore itself. Maybe their petty crimes are a way of acting out against the clan concept that rejected them and kept them apart. They learn to accept their higher-ups' different lifestyles and only stop their banditing once their leaders themselves learn to accept each other at the end of the story. Having them present in the Cobalt Coastland story was also a good idea in game, considering the parallels between the three of them and Paulina and Iskan. Making their last story appearance during the finale when Adamant and Irida were working together was also good, and they seemed to cool down a bit after seeing this. All it needed to feel like a fitting and conclusive end to their story was a few more pointed lines in their interactions with the player and the characters relevant to their arc. <laughs> <laughs> God. <laughs> this analysis of Legends Arceus is an exercise in the importance of dialogue, and what happens when every scene is not given due diligence. No exchange between characters should be considered a throwaway scene. Even comedic, seemingly unimportant dialogue builds character. It's why a line like Melly's straight up fart joke is more standout to me than all of the player's interactions with Akari and Laventon. Because even though Melly is objectively less important than the two Galaxy team members, his jokes make him much more memorable and fun. The misfortunes puns they make during their encounters with the players stuck with me longer than anything Volo and Kogita said about the plates, or the obscure lore that frankly didn't matter as much as other things they could have divulged. Aside from funny lines, Silene's piece of advice she gives the player to support them behind Kamado's back is probably the height of Legend's more serious dialogue. It's an all-encompassing line with undertones of the game's message, while also fitting the situation and not standing out as a sudden moral lecture. Akari and Laventon, who stand next to her, continue to repeat the same garble they tell you every mission at the Wallflower, despite the unique scenario you've now been placed in. 
Silene instantly steals the scene from the other two and becomes a much more interesting character with just one small interaction. Every piece of dialogue is important. A story is told using words, so any amount of them or lack thereof can make or break your story. In the end, Legends is entirely inoffensive, but it pains me to know just how much more emotional the game could have been with just a few small tweaks to dialogue exchanges and scenes. It's similar to how I felt with Sword and Shield, but that's a whole other can of worms. Let me know if a video critiquing Sword and Shield's story and providing my own insight sounds interesting because I got a lot to say about that. It's not all negative either. Again, they set up an interesting story, but severely dropped the ball during the delivery. Ultimately, I believe Legends found itself a home somewhere between Sword and Shield and Black and White stories, which is nearly the entire spectrum of games. Pokemon has always been good at coming up with cool concepts for a plot without expanding upon those ideas properly. They fail in allocating their limited time toward embellishing their story, and instead put it toward creating characters who can introduce game mechanics and push the plot to the next area or boss. This lack of a embellishment and characterization leads to somewhat emotionless storytelling, even if all the aspects of said story are there for the player to piece together. Compared to other recent titles, however, they're clearly taking strides toward telling more complex stories like Black and White once did. I have to applaud Game Freak for trying and succeeding, if not in execution, then in theory. Thank you again for watching! These videos take a long time to make, but I've come to realize they're what I've always wanted to do with YouTube. So you can feel free to subscribe without worrying about me blowing up your notifications. The most you'll get is some random bullshit every other month. Liking and commenting really helps to support content like this, so please let me know what you think of my analysis or of Pokemon Legends in general. Okay, bye. <laughs> <coughs> my throat hurts so much. Uh, I should not have done this on the verge of a cold. As the player climbs Mount Coronet, a uh, uh, Mount Coronet, number 15, Mount Coronet. That voice summoned the most massive spider of my entire life into this room once. I was playing Elden Ring with my sister and it was the part with all the hands that look like spiders. And it summoned a real spider in, in the room we were playing the game in. And because the entire time we were doing some bit with that, the number 15 voice. And when I saw the spider, I went, oh my God, a spider. And then it like, like dive bombed at me. Uh, and then another time we were playing Elden Ring uh, and we were killing those bat things. And I shit you not, a bat was in my house. How many times do you have a bat in your house? So there's either something about number 15 or something about Elden Ring that summons creatures. Anyway, as the- <laughs>